students should know about. So I do a Q&A between myself and the puppets. One of the ones I'm going to do in the future is I've tried to make this interesting for myself. I think I'll put my, make myself the dummy and I'll make the puppets the faculty and I'll have them ask me the questions assuming they're the faculty, the two puppets, and then that will allow me to be in the middle of the conversation. But I put together a rather long presentation for, for 20 minutes, and I'm going to um, give you each of the slides, but I'm gonna emphasize two really important things. One is the biofilm. Um, you may not realize it, but a wound is an incredible biofilm environment. However, what's also important about that wound is we cover it with a gauze. That gauze, given its inoculum from the planktonic form being released by the biofilm, becomes a huge reservoir. We didn't know that. Gauzes are deadly. We use them every day in patient management, but the biofilm that forms inside a gauze on top of a wound is a very bad thing. We, we need to do it, but we're gonna change that, I hope, and even though we have silver and a variety of ingredients in gauzes, the biofilm forms dramatically in the presence of silver. I'll show you a few, few slides. So we, we'd like to get rid of that environment. It's the first thing. Biofilms in gauzes are phenomenal. Secondly, at that gauze level, which was already mentioned by Dr. Brook, horizontal gene transfer. Can you imagine a gauze being an environment for microbes to transfer genes? Incredible place for multi-drug resistance. And the other thing I really want to think, I want you to think about, what do you know about 3D printing? You're all going to say, well, we, we know, we, we hear about it, we read about it. Uh, one, of the very one of the very fortunate aspects of my uh, being able still a, a low in, I call it retirement with a small r. Um, when I go to Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, they're very much into 3D printing. You, you could think about what is the material used for 3D printing. It's a, it's a, it's a variety of materials. What about if you could take plasma, make it into a putty, take a picture of a wound in three dimension, give it to the instrument, and have it make a wound which fits, every, make it a gauze-like material which fits every wound but made in 3D to exactly fit the wound site. So 3D printing is the way we're gonna make our new gauzes but the gauzes aren't gonna be biofilm habitats, hopefully. They will rather be made from plasma. And guess what we're gonna put in the plasma? Probiotics. So that we will leach from the 3D formed wound site a probiotic, and that's what I'm gonna show you. So that's my research, is to use 3D um, printing, which I, I know nothing about. You go to a large university, it's great to have people who are experts in the field, and they know how to 3D print using plasma, but I'm going to give them a brand new type of bacterial colonization, which hopefully will be therapeutic bacteria. The key is we've got to eliminate the biofilm, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. So I'm gonna emphasize those two points. Let me get going, and, and again, this is who I am, and. Uh, Reestablishing the microbial library. Think about that. That's a really good title. The genetics of microbiology and the dual citizenship. There is a benefit to genes of microbes. They're not all detrimental. Can we restructure our relationship by utilizing the strength of the microbiota? And that's what I'm really trying to do. So there's Candy Candida. Uh, over there, there she is here. But the reality is Candy Candida was something that I didn't realize in wound management is the importance of biofilms because we didn't know that. And the co-aggregate of what this organism can do is to build a lattice. So Candida in wounds is not a very good thing. I traveled a great deal. I happened to have the chance of lecturing in Joseph Lister's laboratory uh, Lister, when you think about Listerine, uh, his students, by the way, coined the oral mouth wrench in honor of Lister. Lister didn't make the product Listerine. But the reality was that's his carbolic acid machine where he would spray over wound sites of the 1800s because when men would go to battle and women, they would have serious wounds from sabers and arrows. And when they would amputate, they almost invariably would die. 
Lister came up with the carbolic acid spray machine, became a Nobel laureate. And when I went to lecture in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, I said, I want to put my slides together. And they said, why don't you go up to Joseph Lister's office? And I thought, are you kidding? So I went up to Joseph Lister's office. I sat in his office in his chair, and I reviewed my slides. A little different than having my daughter last night helping me review my slides in the room upstairs. It was really quite, I enjoyed, but it drove my interest in, in the fact that I want to make sure we understand, A, if you use the new molecular means of detecting the surface of skin, the organisms that are available to skin colonization being friendly and present is very important. So if you're going to choose a probiotic, why don't you look at the microbes that are present in three separate samples of skin that are friendly? And that was my first point when I began to really look in this. And you can see the sample starting from top to middle to bottom represent the three environments of skin. But when we looked at the names of the microbes defined by molecular methods, it was a wholly different environment than I particularly had been addressing. This is what we see all the time. This is a chronic wound. Is that too much? Is that OK? Is that OK for you? All right, so this is a chronic wound. This is a wound of a person who had this for almost three years. They come back. It's hospital cost. We try to treat these on an outpatient basis and often are not very successful. When I went to Cardiff and had the expertise of the people there, we began to suggest that maybe the biofilm was the event. And if you look at the concept of upper left to lower right, we began to recognize that biofilms grew on wound sites in a three-dimensional structure and in fact built angiogenesis, so you can see on the lower right, actually having capillary-like vehicles to transmit fluids so that the three-dimensional structure could be better defined by me, and I'm quite proud of this, since I was in the Department of Pathology. I said, what do pathologists do when they look at tumors? They grade them and they have a name for it. And I suddenly said to myself, why don't I grade a biofilm? So I'm going to show you in a moment the 3D a method that I came up with. But the work here done by my colleagues at Cardiff began to show what we would describe as a loosely organized biofilm stage two, a more well-defined tertiary three-dimensional biofilm stage three, and then a stage four biofilm was clearly that stage which A, was undergoing transition to be a transmitter of a planktonic isolate, but then also an organism that had essentially multifunctional capacity. This is an organ system. Hear me, ladies and gentlemen. This biofilm is an organ system. Why don't we call the microbiota of our host, you and me, an organ system? It's not structured, but it's an organ system. And if you begin to believe that, then you also can begin to believe how we began at Cardiff to use various methods to stain cells. And again, I had colleagues around me who were doing the fish technology, which gave us the ability to specifically select a kind of hybridization to the nucleic acid of the targets and begin to identify three-dimensional architecture of wounds. So you saw the ones a few moments ago, but it didn't give us any organization. And as I said to you, in my mind, the microbiota is an organ system. It involves a lot of structure. When we began to use multiple stains of the three-dimensional wound biofilm, we found how clustering and how locally the organisms attached, so that everything that was the same color, in essence, Staph aureus was red, green was Pseudomonas, I'm sure had we looked for Stenotrophomonas, we would have found it. But the bottom line was, look at the organization. This is a community. This is a socio-microbiology. In my mind, biofilmology is socio-microbiology. It is organisms living in great community. And when we began to look, take that same technology, we would go to certain sites that up till this time, here's an orthopedic sample, were all culture negative, because we were looking for planktonic organisms from medical devices. And when we began to apply the techniques that we had learned or that my colleagues taught me, we began to find in sites we never knew would be colonized by biofilms. And this happened to be kinds of tubes that were involved in, in breathing. And we found biofilms everywhere. In fact, I'll almost challenge you. 
I cannot think of a surface in which a biofilm won't grow. Now we can sit here and argue for hours, but I want you to think about that. These were other sites in which we were looking at particularly adenoid tissue because we always in the clinical laboratory, they were always culture negative if an adenoid came down. When we began to do special stainings magnified through our understanding of biofilms, we began to find biofilms were in every tissue sample, in every site. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no sterile site in the human body. I can find microbes in spinal fluid, urines, blood, anytime. We just never had the tools. Is that good or bad? It's dual citizenship. We live with a microbial community. And it is not defined by our history of poor methods. Louis Pasteur was wonderful. He is my god, so to speak, if you will. But Louis Pasteur led us down the wrong road. One bug, one disease. 80% of all diseases in US hospitals are multi-bug chronic diseases associated with a biofilm. It's where it's at. And we, have, we are so limited in the moment of our expression. So if we continue on, what I decided was wounds are, in fact, a very real environment for looking at this process. And that is, we now know it's biphasic. The first phase in red is when the tissue environment defined by pH, oxygen tension, and depth of the wound, if you will, is more of an aerobic but definable planktonic environment. Once we reach critical colonization, when the planktonic organisms reach about 10 to the 6, and you hear that yellow box, we begin to recognize a major change. The bugs have established this socio-microbiology. And the second phase, after the critical colonization of 10 to the 6 microbes, we reach the blue part, and that is where we see the biofilm beginning to form. And as you'll see in a moment, that biofilm not only creates an environment for the wound, it is a means by which colonies that are able to leave the biofilm through planktonic transmission to the gauze above. So here was the first experiment that I ever ran in this sense, and I was flabbergasted. We were checking various gauzes, antibiotic dish, to make sure our control of microbes was adequate. And we found that in triplicates, we could measure zones of this traditional gauzes. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, that would help us. This, these were just triplicates to make sure that our inoculum plate had the right, uh, these were quality control susceptibility desks. You can see that the zone around this group of microbes that was uh, produced by the gauze uh, showed the gauze had activity. But when you take this gauze and tease it apart and look at the inside of the gauze, that's what we grew. So this gauze, which is antibacterial, planktonic wise, was harboring biofilms, because these were biofilms, as you'll see in a moment. So in fact, silver, which is the most traditional means of silver gauzes, uh, didn't do a thing. And I developed this theme, which in essence said, look it, here is the wound bed. It's a biofilm. When we have the right oxygen tension and we have the right pH, we favor a transfer planktonic-wise from the biofilm to the surface fluid of the wound bed, above the bed. It inoculates the other abiotic surface, which is this dressing, and becomes another biofilm, which then completes the cycle by releasing planktonic phyllis in the fluid, who re-inoculates the bed of the, bi of the biofilm wound. And this cycle continues and continues and continues. The worst thing we can do with a wound is put a dressing on it. But we do. That's our management style. We've done it for years. But it's not a very good thing, given the microbiology, not necessarily the patient response. So we determined, if you will, and I just want to show you quickly, that there were an awful lot of resistance parameters within the wound bed, and we were tracking resistance over time. And it was just to point out to you that we were very concerned with resistance in the wound bed. We also then, because of the colleagues I was working with, decided to use what I think will be the future, I'll talk about this tomorrow, flow cytometry. We pass cells through an orifice, and we measure living and dead, and we measure cancer cells. Why don't we send bacteria through there and measure living and dead? So this is flow cytometry, looking at cells grown in the wound bed. And what I want you to realize is that within approximately three days, almost 90% of the population has shifted from a sensitive population to a resistant population. That's a wound bed of a patient who's being treated with a silver gauze. So I was really concerned about that, and I really wanted to look at biofilms. 
this led me to what we were talking about a moment ago. Up at this time, not many people had thought about biofilms in wounds. And this was one of the SDNs that came out with a group that I was associated with as part of. And we began, <laughs> they said, no, there's no biofilm in a wound. Well, if that's not a biofilm, please tell me what it is. Here's three-dimensional structure organized with kinds of means of, of a sensory transfer of, of fluids. And this is a three-dimensional structure that we would essentially say is a biofilm fluid. Why are biofilms so important? And again, because of my time, I want you to look at this. This is plant tonic. This is what we so much work with when we deal with a traditional concept. No diversity, resource consumption, competitive behavior. When you look at a biofilm, it's group selection, it's cooperation, it's economics, it's population heterogeneity, et cetera. So in a world of very competitive environments, to live as a biofilm defeats planktonic filler, and we need to be thinking always about biofilm transfer. Again, I don't have the time, but people say, how do you study biofilms in your laboratory? I don't wanna see a hand racing, but I love to throw this out. Everybody here, I'm not gonna differentiate males and females, who put on makeup, think about this. If you look at your makeup pack, I have three daughters, I can say this, and a wife. You're gonna find in it a poloxomer. A poloxomer is a divalent material which is a reverse gel. Reverse gels at four degrees are liquid, at 37 are solid. It's used as a buffer in every manufacturing product that's associated with facial makeup. However, in the microbial world, when these molecules are arranged, arranged as in here, in cold water it's liquid, in warm water it's solid. Why do you say that? This change in the molecular structure induces a biofilm. So you can take a planktonic staff, you can mix it at four degrees in the walk-in refrigerator with this poly, this material called Peloxamer F127, it's available on commercially. And then take that plate, if you mix the broth with the organism and you took it and put it in an incubator, the organisms will produce a biofilm in a plate. Now you have a means of studying a biofilm in a clinical laboratory. This is not hard, this is not rocket science. Peloxamer F127 induces biofilm formation and it will do so at 37, which is what you would put your plate at to incubate the organism. So along this line, and again because of time, I'm gonna make sure I don't overstay my part. Again, being part of a topology department, I began to think about what a biofilm is relative to tertiary structure. I also began to think about what it means relative to organization. And I began to think that as a pathologist would think, we ought to give it a strange sizing. And I'll show you what this is in much better in a moment. And it's gonna be right here. So what I did, I'm gonna use a 3D in a moment, is I began to, in a poloxomer solution, grow organisms in first their planktonic state, and then induce them so I could take photography through the clear biofilm medium, the poloxomer, and what you're going to see is, as I'm going to show you in a moment, stage one is that stage which is reversible. The plankton organism comes here. It attaches to the surface, and this is reversible. This is when the organisms aren't quite sure what they're going to do. They'll attach, deattach. They'll begin to make a decision. At this stage, we can treat this device. Think of this as an endotrain. By the next four to eight minutes, the biofilm will make a decision that it's going to upregulate and recruit and gather other organisms from the natural environment. And what's so interesting is when it does that, it begins to make a pH gradient. And the pH gradient going from stage one to stage two is very much a part of the anti-infective environment of a biofilm. Because if you can see here, I think of this, this is really cool. This is New York City. This is Long Island. This is New Jersey. And if you were a satellite looking down, the pH of New Jersey is a pH of one because the organisms that you saw a moment ago cluster together. This is a pH of a group of organisms living in Long Island, if you will, as a biofilm part. That's pH 11. And in the middle might be pH seven. Ladies and gentlemen, name me an antibiotic that's stable at pH one to pH 11. It does not exist. Most salts and Antibiotics are salts. They have a pH activity range. And one of the issues that a biofilm creates is a pH gradient. 
And you look at this, look at how clever the biofilm is. By the bottom of stage three, we now have quorum sensing cross communication. And stage four is that stage just before it begins to break apart and it goes back and reverses this entire process all over again. Biofilms generally will form in a wound bed every 48 hours. But if we put a gauze on it, now listen to me. If we put a gauze on this wound that you saw, and I take the gauze off in eight seconds on the wound, I can find a biofilm. Very early, stage one, I can find a biofilm. If you put a catheter in a patient, we can find a biofilm in about one minute. A sterile catheter, one minute. But we've never had the tools. Okay, now what I need you to do is put your 3D glasses on, and hopefully this will work. So this you've already seen, this sort of description. And if I go to the next slide, It may take a moment to run. Oh, come on, come on. Nick, why is my 3D motion not working? Do I have a, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got it right here. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it should rotate. Well, if it doesn't, since we're sort of restricted to time. Um, heck. Well, uh, it should be a, th it, yeah, what we have is a 3D movie. Oh. All right, let's do that. Because I'd like the audience to see that. Can we show me how to do that? Program here. Uh, but the reality is what should, what should happen is these should rotate for you and you should see the three-dimensional structure. And if you look at this slide, it says on the lower left hand, lower right hand side is um, where the actual place in the, where we are in this structure in the formation of the traditional growth pattern of lag, log, stationary, and dev which corresponds to stages one, two, three, and four. And what we did at Cardiff was we were able to show very dramatically how these different organization of structures in three dimension, I'm so disturbed because they do rotate three degrees, 360 degrees, and, it's, and with, dark, with the 3D glasses on, it's really pretty impressive. But it is what it is, so we'll move on. So I said to you before that, um, I'm very interested in, in planktonic phyllis, but also uh, candida, uh, candy candida, because what we didn't know at that stage was how critical this 3D configuration of lag, stage one, log, stage two, stationary, stage three, and death, stage four, was applicable to yeast and mold. And what we found in wounds particularly was this. Here is the attachment site to the gauze, here is the yeast form, and the hypo element is in between. Think of this as a netting to which all other bacteria adhere. This in a wound site is disaster. And this is what we find, is that if we find candida associated with stenotrophomonas, associated with pseudomonas, staphorus, this is the kind of environment. And here are the structural that find. But why is candida so hard to eradicate? Because it has both a form of hyphal elements on the upper attachment in the gauze and also a yeast form at the bottom. That's inside the gauze that we put on the cover to cover a patient's wound bed. And we didn't realize that until we started looking at these kinds of pictures. These are done with a group at Carnegie Mellon and this is when they were actually looking with yeast elements on a silicon surface, but you can see it almost looks like a plant growing on a tissue. And this kind of biofilm three-dimensional structure adds to the bacterial three-dimensional structure, and we get this kind of, again, it's not gonna work, but a 3D configuration that turns rapidly, but it has architecture of size, shape, and height. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that's associated with the gauze that re-inoculates the wound bed as a intermediary and keeps the cycle going. So here's my last bit, I know we're sort of tight for time, but I wanted to look at wound care as we look at oral health. So all of you go to a dentist one time or another, and you talk about plaque, and you talk about 
the organisms involved in the mouth. And in a dental office, we do scaling and root, uh, root planing. Uh, we do some kind of oral rinse. We maintain the environment with our saliva. And we may use some kind of alternate therapy if we have a deep-seated pocket like we would have in periodontal disease. But in dentistry, in the European community particularly, periodontal disease is treated with probiotics. And I thought about that when I was in the UK, and I said, you know, this analogy that I just described is actually what we do with wounds. We debris, we use a chlorhexidine scrub today, we maintain the pH, and we do use these dressings. No one in the US has thought about, or I shouldn't say that, no one has addressed the issue that perhaps the way to readdress the architecture of tissue is to use the friendly combines of a reestablished biofilm, which is friendly and does not produce the pathogenic consequences. Using the microbes you saw at the very beginning that the NIH told us were microbes of skin. So I came up with something called smart dressing. Don't, don't ask me what time of the night I came up with this idea, but it's always at some odd hours my daughter, Kristen, or someone will tell you. And so I thought to myself, we need to be intellectual. We need to design a new way of delivering wound management. It needs to have something that's a biologic barrier, but has a biologic function. It needs to probably have more than one probiotic. It needs to have no antimicrobial activity. And it needs to be a therapy that recognizes stewardship. Rebuild the skin flora to reestablish communication of cells and make matrix building of the tissue a benefit to the host and to the microbes present. And I called my first attempt to do these the smart gauze, and we've gone to the smarter, which was to use filtrates of bugs put into a material. And right now, actually going on today at Carnegie Mellon and Allegheny where I'm at, we're up to my third attempt. And let me show you what that is because I think it's the most interesting. This we are calling the smartest, and the first thing I had to do was go to an international group out of England and said, can you make me a dressing that would deliver a probiotic? And they said, yes, we can do that. You can make this gauze, a probiotic containing gauze, that will only release certain molecules or you can make it large enough to release the bacteria. So we have the ability to use filtrate and the material produced by the bacteria to eliminate and come in contact with the wound, or you can actually make it so that the bacteria are carried. That was what was I called my, my smartest uh, two, and we didn't have a lot of success with that because of this. This is a wound, a chronic wound. Look at the shape. And if you manufacture wound dressings and go back and make them all the same, how many wounds are exactly the same? None. I mean, you know, you've been on a hospital ward, you look at chronic wounds, you look at your own little wounds that you've had growing up, and this is what we see so often. Patients come in and they try to put gauzes on, they're in unusual places, they're colonized with fecal flora, and how are you going to put a gauze on that? So the point that I wanted to make was, I turned to my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, because quite by accident I heard them talking about three-dimensional printing. And I thought, well, there's got to be three-dimensional printing for microbes. So I went and listened to them, and they're all scientists and mathematicians. Carnegie Mellon's very well known for its mathematical in part. And they showed me their 3D printer, and I, I'm going, yeah, <laughs> I'm a microbiologist. I thank you. It was great to see this device. But they pointed out to me, we can take this device, and we can put other materials into it that we can then form a shape three-dimensional of a picture that you took of that wound site. So that's what we are now doing. In the meantime, they have taken this plasma material and started to take pictures of places like football players or athletes who break bones and the bones don't heal, so they put this material into the places where the bone is not healing and it has in it of itself regenerative material. And they said to me, we can make anything you want, but let's go to a plasma-based product. So this is plasma, which you know is around. We can take outdated plasma. We can describe it by making it a clot and calling it a plasma-based material. And you know what? Look at the shapes we can put that material in. These are all different shapes made from 3D printing. What I was interested in 
was I wanted to take my probiotic and put it in this gauze and put it into a wound bed. And that's what we're presently doing is addressing these features of the plasma. It in and of itself is bioactive, consistent, controlled, ready to use. You know what's good about it, ladies and gentlemen? We can use this material anywhere in the world. It stores at room temperature. Now, putting in the probiotic, which is why we thought we might go to a filtered material. And you know what? It cost us to make a 3D gauze about 15 cents. Because you're using probiotics and you're using outdated plasma. And, you know, what does a gauze cost today? Quite a bit. So that's really what today, actually, when I go back, I'm missing it today. Today's what? Tuesday, right? So I'm not in Pittsburgh. I should be. But the bottom line is we are now looking at the idea of plasma carried probiotics to a wound bed matched to the exact shape of the wound itself. And we're going to evaluate the reconstructive cytokines, the reconstructive tissue, the tissue engineering, and what it does to the challenge of the microbes. So I'm very, very excited about that, but because it also addresses this topic that we're here today in One Health. So with that, uh, given my time element, I will end, and I thank you very much. That's a long ways to go from microbiologist to being a wound care management, and I thought it was sort of tough when I dealt with ventilated patients in the ICU. I spent a lot of time in the ICU, but now I'm spending a lot of time on the wound care unit, and it's, it's um, not a pleasant environment. The odors are sometimes challenging. I guess that's the best way I would say that. But when you see people who have had chronic wounds that won't close for five years, and they won't go out because of draining tissue, I mean, it's an area that really needs great exploration. And I think this gives us an alternative we've never really had a chance to investigate. So my microbiology part is, com is, is a cofactor in their plasma-making 3D imaging. And if you get, again, you're bored at night and can't sleep, it's now called micro 3D bioprinting. Micro 3D bioprinting is now becoming a major issue because it has this potential to shape, size, and define the carriers of probiotics or, God forbid, antibiotics to a wound site. So thank you very much. Any, any questions, anybody?